This is the Plant Yourself Podcast. I'm Howard Jacobson of plantyourself.com and the Big Change Program with Josh Lajani. This podcast is part of my mission to help you live a courageous and committed life. Ah, one quick order of business for today before we get to the interview, and that is announcing the winners of the Mercy for Animal books, written by last week's guest, uh, Nathan Runkel. The winners are Lisa Ponto and Blair Seibert. So, Lisa and Blair, thanks very much for participating, and I'll get your books out to you via media mail as quickly as I can. Okay, let's get to today's episode, which has jumped to the front of the queue. I recorded it on Tuesday, and it's jumped ahead of all the other ones because of the timely nature of what we're talking about, which I will explain in just a minute. My guest is Dr. Sarai Stancic, whom I met at Plant Stock over the summer. She has an amazing story. She was an infectious disease specialist, She, which is kind of, you know, in the 1980s and 90s, it was the... Uh, the pinnacle of the medical profession because of the HIV AIDS and hepatitis epidemics. And it certainly seems like infectious disease was the place to be if you wanted to move the needle hugely in terms of human health. Well, then in uh, 1995, she was a third year medical resident and she collapsed during a long shift and was admitted to the ER and found out that she had Pretty severe, pretty aggressive multiple sclerosis, multiple lesions in the brain and the spinal cord. In addition to neuropathy in her legs, her kidneys were failing. Here was this young, energetic woman who was set out to change the world, and all of a sudden, she was a helpless patient in the system that she um, had entered in order to be powerful within it. Dr. Stancic knew from personal experience, having treated many MS patients over the years, what the disease progression looked like, even with the best pharmaceutical protocols available at the time, which is continued decline, increased pain, increased disability, and really no possibility of reversal or cure. Her doctors told her that she'd almost definitely be in a wheelchair in 20 years. And on the 20th anniversary of her diagnosis, she celebrated by walking 20 miles unaided. So if that were the whole story, that would be amazing enough. But Dr. Stancic, in addition to being a pioneer in lifestyle medicine, is also a fierce reformer of the medical profession. And given how much whole food plant-based protocols played into her amazing recovery, she cannot understand why the medical profession does not adopt a plant-based diet as one of the pillars, the fundamental pillars of medicine, upon which everything else that the uh, medical profession does, pills, surgeries, all that stuff, is built. But plant-based diet, lifestyle, healthy lifestyle in general as the foundation. So part of her advocacy is the making of a film, a documentary called Code Blue. And I saw a clip of it at Plant Stock, and it was riveting. It was really, really good. And the filming is basically done. Uh, when we had talked, she had just returned from Cornell to do an interview with T. Colin Campbell. And the film is now ready for post-production, for editing. And apparently that stuff is expensive. And so uh, Dr. Stancic has uh, organized a Indiegogo campaign to raise the funds to get this movie out into the world and hopefully change the medical profession profoundly and forever. Hence the fast tracking of this episode. The Indiegogo campaign runs until November 17th. So you've got a week in which to uh, listen to the episode, go to the Indiegogo page, check out the video that they've made and decide if you'd like to support what I think is going to be a game changer of a documentary. So you know from Forks Over Knives that a documentary can change the world. It can change people's lives. I think Code Blue could be another one of these but they need our help. So let's talk about Code Blue. Let's talk about Dr. Stancic's amazing journey of illness and recovery and all her advocacy efforts. And without further ado, Dr. Sarai Stancic, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you so much, Howard. It is a pleasure to be with you. So we met up at uh, uh, Claverack, New York for Plant Stock 2017, where I... Um, heard you tell your story, which was just amazing. And equally amazing is the project you're working on right now. But why don't we start with kind of your, your, your origin story, um, where, you know, you're uh, becoming a doctor, what sort of medicine you practiced, and then the, uh, 
the day that shook everything up? Sure. So uh, I went to medical school in Newark, New Jersey, and um, back in the late 80s, early 90s. And during that time, if you recall, it was the height of the HIV epidemic. So during my experience in medical school, I witnessed so much of that um, a horrific epidemic, and it was it was that experience that led to my wanting to pursue a career in infectious diseases. So that's what I did for for many years. Um, but today, I no longer practice infectious diseases, and uh, and I've become a passionate advocate of preventive medicine, or what we call lifestyle medicine, which really focuses on uh, addressing the importance of optimal nutrition, physical activity, stress management. Because importantly, when we look at the scientific literature, we find that when we address these parameters, we can indeed prevent nearly 80% of chronic disease. And that's extraordinarily powerful. So um, a large part of the reason why I've become or why I've evolved into someone who is so passionate about lifestyle medicine and about plant-based nutrition is largely because of my personal story. So uh, back when I was a... Go ahead. So, so yeah, I'm just I'm curious about just the um, the transition from infectious to chronic, and I and we'll, we'll we'll get to the your your personal journey. But it, you know, in, in my study of sort of the history of medicine, infectious disease is kind of the like the all stars, you know, like from Pasteur and Koch and and uh, you know the vaccines and you know, sort of doing this like epidemiological shoe leather research and discovering the vectors of disease and coming up with the cures that, you know, that was kind of like the, you know, the A team and the idea of sort of prevention. See, it's, it seemed much less uh, sort of sexy and exciting. Like it's, you know, that's where the students in the bottom quarter of their class would go. Um, right. did, did you, was there any point at which, um, you know, you, you kind of had to make peace with lifestyle medicine as, you know, that you, you had to kind of change your mind about um, its, its relative value and importance? Well, you know, that's a really good question. I, I think for me, uh, it, was, it was quite a transition and it was a journey over time because infectious diseases was really my world. And, and just as you described, that was the uh, era in which I grew up. And, and that's what I understood, particularly for me, it was obviously trying to understand HIV and hepatitis, the, the diseases of my era. And, and then going from that background into uh, what I do today is really quite a significant transition. And again, it was, it was not just uh, for sure, it was, it was in large part my personal experience as a patient, but also my experience as a physician, because so much of what I was seeing in clinical practice, for example, you know, a diabetic patient coming in with an infected diabetic foot ulcer, uh, a complication of diabetes, yet another chronic disease, and how that led uh, to the compromise of that patient's quality of life and, and, and uh, you know, uh, mortality rates that, that really when I looked at it from a bird's eye view and understanding that, wow, I mean, these are diseases that we can prevent and all this morbidity uh, that is associated with this disease is preventable. So it was really about seeing the world with a different set of eyes, a different perspective. And again, that all evolved over many, many years. It didn't happen overnight. I mean, I, uh, uh, my journey really began uh, in, in 2003 when I first came across some literature that connected uh, the, you know, disease with diet, something that regrettably is not taught or not emphasized uh, during medical school. Right. So, so let's, let's um, back up, I guess, seven or eight years from, from 2003, which, you know, the, the life-changing event that eventually got you onto do, doing that literature search in the first place. Can you, can you right. kind of take us through that? Because you, you described it so rivetingly i don't want to take it i don't want to <laughs> deprive our listeners of of your version sure so uh october 11th 1995 i was a third year medical resident and on that particular night i was on call and it was a really really busy on night uh on call i was just you know running all around the hospital and, and it wasn't until sometime between two and three o'clock in the morning in which i found a window to make it back uh to the on-call room to take a brief nap and uh, the minute I got to that bed, I felt as, I was so tired, uh, something I had never experienced before. And shortly thereafter, I was paged again to address another urgent matter. And when I tried to get up out of that sleeping position, I couldn't feel my leg. 
Uh, and I remember reaching down to touch them, Howard, and it was the eeriest feeling because it, they felt like someone else's legs. And I remember just panicking. And next thing I knew, I was in the emergency room undergoing an MRI of my brain and spinal cord. And those studies confirmed a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis with multiple lesions in both my, my brain and spinal cord. And, and everything changed. Uh, you know, just like that overnight, uh, I was no longer this young, healthy physician. I was now an MS patient, and I was admitted that night to the hospital. And um, I was started on IV steroids, and before I knew it, another four or five medications to now treat uh, the other complications that I had developed. My bladder was failing. Uh, I, was, I had pain from uh, neuropathic pain from the disease, and um, and it was just the most frightening experience because the day before I was fine. I was whole. I was complete. I was this young woman who was about to take off her career in her career in medicine. And I was, I had everything in the world to look forward to. And all of a sudden um, it, it looked really dark for me. So it was a, it was a very difficult period in my life. Uh, now. So I, I, I can sort of appreciate, you know, at least conceptually how scary it must've been for you as an individual, but as as a third year medical student, as a as a lifelong practitioner, an observer of medicine, were you were you concerned about like what they were doing to you? Like you know, oh, let's put her on steroids. Let's let's give her four or five other meds. Were you sort of at, at that point just accepting like, well, they know what to do and they'll do the best they can, or were you starting? Oh. Were you having any doubts that um, oh, no. you know maybe this isn't the right tr- treatment protocol? Oh. No, no, no. At that point, I, I entrusted the physicians that I that were were caring for me, and in fact, uh, many of them were professors of mine that I had uh, trained with. So I, I felt that I was in the best of hands. And um, but I also, as the as a physician, I had also uh, treated and cared for and, and experienced many MS patients in the past, and I knew what this disease was like, and I and I knew. Uh, uh, what my future could be like. And so that, I think, further enhanced my fear because I, I knew that uh, this was a disease that could certainly um, rob me of, of quality of life. And even at that point, I was considering, you know, could I continue being a physician? W- was this going to compromise my ability to practice medicine? So there were a lot of a lot of issues that I was considering at the time, but I didn't at all question the conventional treatment or the approach, and, and, I, and I felt full confidence in those that were caring for me. And I can tell you that um, in that hospitalization, as they worked me up and, and, and they did additional studies, the doctors sat me down and, and said, you know, this is, you, you have significant disease at this point, and it's important for you to understand that this, this is likely going to continue and, and progress, and you need to start planning ahead because uh, there's a very good chance that in 20 years you may be in a wheelchair. And you know, I was 28 years old at the time, so that was very, very difficult for me to hear. But I knew that now I wasn't, I needed to think big picture and, and think f- the future and how I was going to maybe rearrange what I was going to do um, and what my life would look like in light of this new diagnosis. Right. And, and just to, to put a pin in it, um, 20 years after that was two years ago. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's been 22 years. I just, uh, I just commemorated. Sometimes I say celebrated, but I, it, for me, it is a celebration. I commemorated October 11th, uh, 2017 was 22 years. Yes. Uh, so um, before, before we get to that, <clears throat> that 2003 article that began the cascade of, of events that changed your life and your practice, um, I'm wondering if there were any gifts in that diagnosis for you. And it's, it's, it's like a weird thing to say, but, you, but I'm picking up on you saying celebration uh, yeah. or commemoration. Like, I'm yeah. sure, you know, it, it, it changed you in ways that you couldn't have foreseen or imagined. And I'm wondering, what, are, what do you see any sort of positives or gifts or, you know, I wouldn't trade this for the world at this point, the way some, you know, some people talk about their their diagnoses that that flip their lives upside down. Yeah, I know that it, it sounds odd to say so, but I I do consider it a gift. I think it changed my life in in an extraordinary way. Yes, I suffered for many years, and I struggled for many years. But the person that I am today, um, I'm so grateful for because I I think I have, like I said, 
um, a new perspective. Um, I appreciate life so much more than I think I could have otherwise. And I think I've become uh, a much better physician, a much better mother, a better, a much better wife. I just think that life is um, a blessing for me. And to to where I am today, like I said, 22 years since that diagnosis and, and since that day where they told me uh, I would likely be in a wheelchair in 20 years. And by the way, you know, on October 11, 2015, when I uh, the 20th anniversary of my disease. I actually walked 20 miles on that day <laughs> again, again to, commem- to commemorate that day because I'm so grateful from what all I've learned, the journey and the experiences that I've had uh, that have led me to where I am today. And the most important thing for me, Howard, is that now I'm able to share my message with my patients and community and colleagues. And my hope is to educate and empower them so they can do the same because this is something that, again, as physicians and as healthcare professionals, we're not speaking to the power of optimal nutrition. I mean, the plant-based diet is so, so important. And every day we're learning more and more and gaining more and more evidence in the scientific literature to support the importance of this of this uh, uh, dietary pattern. But again, it's not just diet, it's all the other things that we speak to within lifestyle medicine, which is of course, physical activity, stress management, effective sleep hygiene, the avoidance of tobacco, um, the reduction or near elimination of alcohol. These are all things that we struggle with in, in our country and things that we need to address. And it is regrettable that physicians don't make this priority. And that's really my goal uh, uh, with the latter half of my career is to focus on this, to bring this level of awareness, not only to my community, but also to my peers, um, other physicians that, you know, this is not uh, voodoo. This is not uh, unconventional medicine. This is not, um, and, and again, it's not that I'm putting down what we're doing. I mean, we do so many amazing things in clinical medicine and the uh, the advances that we've uh, acquired in, in the past a couple of decades have been extraordinary. But my goodness, we need to assure that this is addressed. And this should be the foundation on which all physicians learn. I mean, we this is regrettably, again, something that is not being conveyed during the experience of, of medical education. And that's in large part why uh, I'm making the film Code Blue because I, ho- I hope to catalyze change in that structure, in that academic structure, so that this is built into um, the foundation of medical education, and not just in medical schools, but in all healthcare professionals, nursing, you know, uh, dietitians, uh, physical therapists. We all need to be speaking to this ubiquitously and universally, because in that fashion, I believe we can really effectively turn the tide of the chronic illness epidemic. Great. So let's go back to those the five the eight years between your diagnosis and your discovery of plant based nutrition. What what so what what was your life like? What was what was the progression of of the disease and what were and weren't you able to do? Right. So um, when when I was initially diagnosed, I was told it was important that I start a, a disease modifying therapy. So these are back in 1995, Howard, there was only one drug approved by the FDA. Today, I think we have about a little more than a dozen drugs that have been approved. But essentially, the, I was told that without this drug, uh, I would definitely be in a wheelchair. So this was my, my best shot at slowing the progression of the disease. Now, the problem was that that medication uh, had a significant side effect profile that included things like fever, chills, muscle aches and pains, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, anorexia, insomnia, hair loss, depression, suicidal thoughts. I mean, that's the side effect profile of this wow. horrific drug. Yeah. Wow, it sounds like you, you uh, sounds like you could get a job reading the uh, the, right. the, the symptom list. You do you do that really well. <laughs> well, you know, I lived with it for a long time, and it really. Uh, it tore me apart for a good period of my of my life. And, you know, this was an injectable drug that I would have to inject uh, every night. And they would wake me up a few hours later, and I would experience uh, all these events. And so you can imagine that in my having to get through a day, I mean, I was still a physician, I still had to go to work and see my patients. And, and then uh, this was what I was encountering on a daily basis, it almost felt like, you know, that that film Groundhog Day with Bill Murray, where he just wakes up every every morning and it's the same day. Uh, uh-huh. It didn't get better. It didn't get better. Those symptoms were really. Uh, and so what would happen is I would go back to my doctor and tell him, you know, I can't sleep because this drug is waking me up or, um, you know, I'm, uh, and then he would give me a medicine, uh, uh, another drug to treat the side effect of that drug. 
And before I knew it, and so every time I went back, uh, it was always a, another medicine. I couldn't wake up. I had no no energy. I was fatigued, so they would give me a medicine called Provigil, which is an amphetamine-like drug. So you can you can imagine how over a couple of months and years, you, you just keep tagging on medications to treat the side effect of the other drug. And so by the time I was, you know, a couple of years into this disease, I was taking uh, nearly a dozen drugs, maybe more. I don't, at some point I stopped counting. And, you know, I was a young woman, a 30-year-old woman with a pill box. And despite all of the medicines, uh, my disease progressed. I was having exacerbations regularly. And so around, uh, I was, you know, four or five years into the disease, I started to become largely dependent on a cane. And um, for years, I didn't, I didn't feel my legs. I had a, a bad bladder. I, there were times where I had to wear a diaper, you know. So it was humiliating. And I mean, I was a young woman. And, I, and you know, even simple things like uh, make, taking a trip somewhere. For example, if I had to go to uh, a convention or, or meeting, an annual meeting for, for my discipline, like the Infectious Disease Society of America, I would travel to these conferences because I was going to present a paper or a poster and uh, and I would plan ahead, like I would look up the convention center and know where the bathroom was, know where the lecture hall that I wanted to go to, because I knew I could only, I only had stamina for so many steps and I could only tolerate so much pain. It was, so it was like my life was so limited and there was so much energy placed into planning, like what I could do and what I couldn't do. And I felt like I was just little by little losing more and more. And again, I was in my early 30s, and I didn't think I, you know, it, I was very, very depressed in addition to all of that because I, I felt like every month that went by, I was a little bit less and less. Right. Can I ask, were, were you married at this point? I was. Um, I, my, my husband, believe it or not, my husband met me about a month before my diagnosis. And I, I, he's an amazing man because anybody else would have run in the opposite direction, but he was there for me throughout that um, hospitalization and, and what followed. So we were married in uh, two years after my diagnosis and he's been with me and, and since, and, and it's been an extraordinary, I, I, I'm so fortunate that, that my husband is the man that he is. Wow. Sounds like a keeper. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would say so. <laughs> Great. So, uh, so your life was sort of becoming more and more defined by your your limitations. Um, yeah. And yet, you know, you were still. Was there a point at which now you're you're losing faith in the conventional medical wisdom, or were you just sort of losing faith in your own body? I think a little bit of both. Uh, I was starting to question, you know, the, why was I, these medicines that were supposed to be slowing things down, these medicines that were supposed to uh, make things tolerable, weren't really delivering on that um, promise. And I even de developed complications like drug-induced liver injury from one of uh, the medicines where my liver enzymes went up really high and it was, it was you know, very, very concerning. Uh, so I was at some point, I, I started to, to think, you know, this isn't working. And um, I think at some point, I just gave up. I, I, I don't even remember what I, I think I've sort of blocked it all out. But I remember feeling very, very sad and feeling and, and, and losing hope until uh, that very special day when I, I, I came across an article that um, really changed my life. And it wasn't, as you as you heard me, um, tell at plant stock. It wasn't anything extraordinary. It wasn't a very powerful paper, but yet it played such an important. Um, it was that aha moment. You know, it was that light that came in in that in that darkness. And it was just a throwaway medical journal that that came across my desk. Uh, and uh, for whatever reason, I picked it up. You know, on the cover of the of the journal, it, I saw the words multiple sclerosis and blueberries. And then, and I thought to myself, what in the world could blueberries? have to do with multiple sclerosis and um, I read the article and it was not uh, it was pretty unscientific it, but it essentially it took a group of MS patients and and put half of them on a diet rich in blueberries and the other half just a standard American diet and they concluded that those that ate the blueberries uh, felt better that they had a little less fatigue and of course as a scientist and objective physician I couldn't the idea of a subjective clinical endpoint to me didn't resonate but 
but something about this study um, I couldn't stop thinking about. And of course it wasn't that I thought blueberries were going to solve my problems. For the very first time in my life, I considered the following question, and that was could diet be playing a role in disease formation? And that sounds sort of crazy in this in in this era, but um, you know, I, I went to medical school and and all those years of training that followed, and not once did I hear any any connections between diet and disease. You know, throughout all those experiences, all those brilliant professors and uh, clinicians that I had trained me, I had never heard those connections. So this, although it sounds uh, uh, elementary to you, uh, it, it didn't to me. And so I, it was that silly study that made me think I need to look into this. And so I turned to the literature looking for answers. And of course, what I came across was nothing short of extraordinary. There was indeed ample evidence in the literature that connected these two dots. And I wondered why was that I hadn't learned about this in medical school and why wasn't that my doctors had um, brought this up? I mean, there were there was literature that, that discussed diet in, in MS patients and it was uh, one of the first individuals to write about this was Dr. Roy Swank who published a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1952. So that was 65 years ago. And so yeah. that was... And so did, did these... Um... Did these other studies sort of pass your uh, clinical sniff test in terms of being, you know, objective endpoints and, and well designed and, and enough, big enough sample size? Well, you know, that's a really good question. They weren't the ideal clinical studies that we would, in, in clinical science, um, hold to be the gold standard, right? The randomized placebo controlled study. Uh, there, there, much of the work that had been done was observational. For example, Roy Swank's work in which he followed 140 patients for 34 years, the criticism there is that he didn't have a, a control a control group. He had a historical control. So certainly, and it's very difficult, the challenges that we have in clinical studies as they relate to diets, it's very difficult uh, to compare uh, that study model to, for example, developing a drug. It, it's very different uh, uh, qualifications. But um, when I, when I, the literature that I've read, and again, it wasn't just Swank's work. It, it, we, there, we started to see evidence uh, as it relates to the microbiome and how it uh, uh, changes in the microbiome affect the, the immune system. So I started to piece all of, all of these, uh, these, pe these puzzle pieces together, and, it, and they started to really uh, resonate with me. And, and, and I said to myself, well, if it doesn't address my MS, it certainly will address uh, my overall uh, well-being. Because what I, did, what I did know in reading all of the literature, you know, the Seventh-day Adventist, the DASH study, the, uh, um, the Leon Heart trial, I mean, there was ample evidence in literature that, that diet was playing a role in, in cardiometabolic disease. There was, uh, there was certainly uh, evidence in the literature that it was playing a role in, in diabetes and, and certainly a building body of evidence that in autoimmune disease there was a role. So um, as, as I took all of the literature in totality, I was convinced at some point that it, was, it would be relevant for me to employ changes in my own life. Right. Now, was, was there a point at which you changed your view on what constitutes good study design? So I, I was on your website and I saw, you know, there's a a picture of you with Dr. Esselstyn, and then I think on Facebook, you and Dr. Campbell. And, you know, so if you've, if you've grown up in the world of infectious disease where you're trying to find, you know, the magic bullet, of course, the randomized, double-blind, controlled cl clinical trial is the gold standard. Did you start to see that there were other forms of gold standard that might be more appropriate for, for lifestyle issues? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, like I, like I said, I think the, the the person that I was uh, 22 years ago or even 25 years ago, the way I was trained and the way I see the world now is completely different. Uh, my perspective has shifted, and and so that the evidence that is available to us today, I think, is uh, extraordinarily uh, in support. Is it extraordinary and overwhelmingly in support of this uh, this diet and and this lifestyle? So. When when you started seeing this overwhelming evidence, was what was what was the what was the emotional accompaniment? I mean, I mean, I can, I'm imagining, you know, hope for the first time in eight years, but also maybe some anger and betrayal. What what was the mix like? 
I think, I think again, there was a little bit of both. Uh, I, there was certainly hope that this might be an avenue for me, that this might be a pathway to improving uh, the quality of my life. And then there was also regret and, and almost not anger, but more almost sadness that this was something that was being ignored. And it was interesting that when I did raise uh, this option to my mainstream conventional colleagues, there was all, there was anger on their part. You know, there was disappointment that they they made me feel um, like I was being irresponsible for, by even considering this. You know, and I wasn't sure why, and I'm still not sure why uh, uh, many of my colleagues find this uh, this approach, this idea that that changing our lifestyle, that changing our diet, could in fact uh, make a significant difference in not only the prevention of disease, but also in the maintenance and reversal of disease. There's still a lot of pushback on that, and I'm not quite sure why that is, because again, this is how is this hurting anyone? It's only going to serve us. I'm not, I'm not pushing anything that is non-evidence-based. I'm not saying take a boatload of supplements or take, you know, IV vitamins. I mean, there, there are folks that do that kind of stuff, and I'm not aligned with that at all. Everything I speak to is aligned with the scientific literature, and there's ample evidence to support it. So, yes, I mean, there was definitely this sense of, like, I was, of, I think, more sadness than anger. And, again, t- fueling that, that sentiment within myself to create change, to bring awareness to, again, not just my community, but also my colleagues, really trying to get them on board. Because for me, if we need all doctors to speak to us to this, not just a handful of us, we all need to speak to it. Because if we do, we can change uh, this chronic illness epidemic that we're living in the midst of, regrettably, something that we can all speak to. So, but if I find the doctors are can be sort of patronizingly tolerant if you're going to, you know, meditate or, you know, eat blueberries as long as you stick with the protocol. But it's at a certain point you decided to um, to abandon the conventional treatment, right? Right. In, in 2003, uh, I decided that I was going to come off all of the medicines uh, and I was going to adopt this. What I, after, again, this is something that I thought through very carefully and I thought through for myself was the best approach whatever I was doing wasn't working uh, and I decided that this was in my best interest now it wasn't easy because my physicians were not happy Uh, they they repeatedly told me it was a mistake Um, no one thought it was the right thing to do at the time but for me, it was I needed to be free of these medicines because they were, you know, curtailing my ability to, to just to live my life. And I and I and, and the one person I needed to, to get on board that I needed support from, there was only one person's opinion that I needed. And that was my husband. And after talking to him and he was nervous because uh, he's a physician as well and had read the literature and he was concerned that he that uh discontinuing the disease modifying therapy would would lead to a hastening uh-huh. of the disease and uh but we made that decision together and in 2003 uh I decided to come off the medicines and uh really uh, address my lifestyle. Right. And so and when you look at the at the scientific evidence the the best evidence for these conventional disease-modifying therapies, it's just that they're going to slow down an inevitable decline into, into disability and in, in increasing suffering, right? There's no, no one was saying we can cure this or put it f- fully into remission and, li- and let you live a full, normal, and happy life, right? Right, absolutely. There's no cure. And, and so the idea of, with these medications is to reduce um, what we call exacerbations or attacks, and uh, to slow the progression. That that's really what what the FDA approval uh, is. Gotcha. So so I mean, when you, just when you look at it in terms of just you know risk benefit analysis, it 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 seems like a no brainer <laughs> you would want to go well, for the thing that promises a form of healing as opposed to you know mitigating the worst for a while. Well, I mean, again, I think that's a very individual decision for patients. I never tell patients uh, who uh, ask my advice on that they should not 
take a disease modifying therapy. I think for some, for many patients, it's an effective uh, approach. But what I'm saying is, even if you des- decide to to take a disease modifying therapy, uh, why not also address lifestyle? And I think that's a major uh, gap in managing MS patients. Uh, ac- you know, not only nationally but globally. I think that it should be an aspect of uh, just like it is of any other chronic disease management, uh, I think it's important in, that, in, in managing all diseases. But right now, I don't think that the, the average neurologist speaks to patients about diet and, and exercise and, again, all the things we talk about in lifestyle medicine. And I think if we did that, that would go a long way. I would love to see clinical studies addressing this and, and, and have, you know, the NIH or some large government, government uh, agency uh, invest in, 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 in this very important scientific question because I can tell you that it has, again, we don't practice medicine anecdotally, but it's not just me. I've met so many uh, patients living with MS that have similar stories. And, um, and we're now learning, Howard, that the microbiome is, telling, is giving us many, uh, many potential answers, um, that there, there may be significant um, reasons why the immune system uh, begins to quiet down and exacerbations uh, begin to uh, reduce in patients with MS who adopt a plant-based diet and, again, address all those parameters that we discussed earlier. I think the work that Swank did in the 1950s, uh, and a lot of, you know, people in in, in the neuro- neurology world consider his work sort of... Um, you know, again, not based in science, how could diet change uh, this complicated autoimmune neurological disease? Uh, It seems so simple. But today we're starting to learn from a scientific perspective and understanding the mechanism as how how that might happen. And, you know, we, we know the tip of the tip of the iceberg, this human body of ours is so very complicated, and it's probably going to be many years before we fully understand it. But what's the what's the um, the downside of eating a plant based diet? It's only going to serve us. We're going to be leaner. Where cholesterol is going to be better. Um, we're going to reduce our likelihood of developing diabetes. We're going to reduce our likelihood of developing cancer. I mean, there's so many um, valuable aspects. So I would tell MS patients who come to see me, um, you know, it's not just um, you're here to see me because you want. Uh, to better manage your MS. But here's the other wonderful benefit. You're also going to reduce your risk of developing breast cancer. You're going to reduce your risk of developing cardiovascular disease, of, of diabetes, uh, of, of obesity. I mean, obesity and diabetes are exploding in our country. And, uh, and that's largely in part of this standard American diet that is fueling uh, these epidemics. And what, well, you know, what, what strikes me about the story is um, I hear you when you say that, you know, it's an individual choice, but people aren't given the choice, right? They aren't, they aren't told that there's this, this other option. They don't have the information to make an informed decision about what treatment protocol. It's almost as if, like, we're having trouble with, our, um, w- with rain getting into the foundation of our house. And so, you know, we can, of course, we can replace boards and we can, we can dig French drains, but it's almost like nobody ever says, hey, you know, you could get better gutters and the rain will never get there. Right. 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 So this, well, it's, um, you know, we could, we could end up like, you know, digging up the entire foundation or having to tear down the house and move just because no one ever mentioned that there is a, a natural and much cheaper and much less invasive, uh, you know, option that also serves many other benefits as well. And, you know, in 1995, they said, you said you were put on, you know, steroid drip, you were given this single drug. Um, It doesn't sound like anyone went over any options with you. And it sounds like that by and large, with the exception of you and a bunch of other folks in the lifestyle medicine camp, that's still patients experience to this day. I think in large part that's true. Um, I, uh, if you if you have uh, an MS specialist evaluate you, I think it's unlike it's un, unusual to have an MS specialist who's speaking to lifestyle. There are some, and I've met some of them. I just met a gentleman at the American College of Lifestyle Medicine conference who speaks to this. He still uses disease modifying therapies, and and I, that's fine for me. I think we have to do the clinical studies, but at least he's speaking uh, to the power of plant-based nutrition and, and lifestyle. There are physicians that are um, spread all over the country 
Uh, there's a, a wonderful um, neurologist at in, in Portland, Oregon. Her name is Vijay Yadav. She's been doing work with John McDougall. They did a plant-based study uh, and published it in 2015 in a small a small pilot study. I think it was 60 plus patients looking at a plant-based diet, and they were able to show in that very small study that patients who adopted the plant-based diet, again, these are MS patients lost on average 20 pounds, their cholesterol improved, all these cardiovascular endpoints improved, but they were unable to show a difference in uh, um, lesion and burden of, of lesions on MRI. But again, it was a one-year study. And what we need to do, MS is a chronic disease. You really, in order to design an effective study that's going to give us real answers, we need to follow patients for an extended period of time to really understand uh, how uh, lifestyle is playing a role in in a progression of the disease. But that takes a lot of money and um, a lot of willpower. So we need to find someone who, or an organization, like I said, like the NIH would be willing, or maybe the National MS Society who has the funding to invest in a study like that so that we can uh, present this as a as a viable option for patients. Physicians uh, are, are, Howard, regrettably do not get education on, on nutrition uh, throughout medical school, and they don't get it through their residency program. So that's the problem, right? So if neurologists, who, by the way, um, have the best intentions for their patients, I mean, they're not withholding this approach because, uh, you know, they have an ulterior motive. They just aren't trained in it. It's not part of their experience. So as they're training through their, as the residents in neurology, they're not getting this from their mentors. And, and that's what we need to change. We need to change the experience so that this is incorporated as part of the therapeutic approach in managing, again, not just MS patients, but all chronic diseases. Right. So, so let's go back from, from the, uh, the study we can't afford to do yet to, to an anecdote of one. And I'm curious, like what happened for you and to you when you began to implement a plant-based diet? And first of all, like what, what did it look like? What did you do to, you know, what were you eating? How did you transition? What was easy? What was hard? And then what, what did, uh, what did you see in terms of results? Right. So uh, my diet was essentially uh, a standard American diet. And, it, and, you know, I was a young woman at that point. Uh, well, I mean, in 2003, not so young, but uh, I, I, was, I was busy. I, had, uh, I was working, and, and so a lot of it was maybe eating out and, uh, you know, picking up stuff at the local, you know, uh, restaurant. So there was a lot of that, of that. My husband, we were both practicing and, and early in our career, so uh, time was, was, was difficult. To, it was difficult to find time, rather, to, to, to cook at home. So it was about restructuring how I was going to do that. So I, 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 we didn't go out to eat anymore. I was preparing all my meals. Uh, I was, in the past, somebody who would skip breakfast. So now I was eating breakfast and it was, it was a plant-based breakfast. It was oatmeal and blueberries and, and uh, I cut out any kind of dairy. All all of those things were significant changes in my life. It was difficult at first because I enjoyed that, you know, cream in my coffee or, or that, uh, I don't know, bagel with cream cheese, that kind of thing that I might've had in the past. So I changed all of that. And, and also, it was getting to exercise. For years, I hadn't done anything. Back in the 1990s, uh, I was told not to exercise. It was felt that exercise was, go- was going to exacerbate the disease. And we know differently today, right? We have plenty of evidence in the literature that now supports the importance of exercise in MS. So it was about me getting started on exercise. And so at that point, I, I was, again, unsteady on my feet. So the only option was a stationary bike. And the first time I got on that bike, I could only do a minute and I was in extraordinary pain and it would, it would take about 10 to 15 minutes to recover from that one minute, uh, for me because I would have like pins and needles, a shower of pins and needles and pain. And, uh, I would get back on the next day and, and the next day and little by little that one minute rolled into five into 10 and I started to build stamina. Um, I started to address my crazy hours at work, and I redefined how I was going to. Everyone on my team knew that by five o'clock I was leaving the office, and I stuck to that. 
And again, of course, if there was a patient emergency, I, I, I would change that. But, but on, on, on most days, I left by 5 p.m. And then sleep for me, you know, sleep was one of the hardest things for me, Howard, because I was placed on Ambien uh, for years. And Ambien is a really tough drug uh, to come off. And um, I really struggled with that. And, you know, they say it's not an addictive drug, but uh, yes, I believe it is. Um, mm. That was that was one of the hardest things for me to do. But as I, I did all of these things, it was very hard at first. And I can tell you, I even had uh, an exacerbation that first year. Uh, and at that point, I remember my doctor saying, you see, this is, you've done this because you've, you, you've abandoned the medicines and you've, you've led to this. Um, and it's for that reason that you, you've had this exacerbation. And I started to feel very nervous that I had made a mistake um, but again, with my husband's support, I, I, I powered through that, recovered from that exacerbation. And um, the, at, over the months and years that followed, I, uh, every, you know, I would notice new things that improvements, like I could, I could, I had very bad hyperesthesia, meaning very, very uh, sensitive uh, feet, toes. So even putting on a pair of socks was, was painful at times. And I started to notice that I could put on my socks and, and feel okay or there were days that I didn't need to take the cane that I felt confident on my own two feet and without any assistance or there were days that I could stay up past the evening news and little by little I started to gain uh, confidence and and uh, I started to feel better and um, I think sometime around 2005 um, my brother came to visit me from Los Angeles and he had just recently run the Los Angeles Marathon and um, we were, he had noticed how I had improved and had, and, and I had even lost some weight. I had lost 10 to 15 pounds now having come off the medicines and again, just getting physically active and, and this diet that was uh, sustaining me. And I felt, I felt so good. And he said to me at the time that, you know, you look amazing. You look like your old self again. Um, I know this is going to sound crazy, but I think you should consider running a marathon. And I remember sort of getting angry at him for even suggesting it and sort of lashing back at him and saying, are you kidding me? I have MS. I can't, I can't do that. And um, I always say this, that it was a great gift my brother gave me on that day because I think for so long I had defined myself as this woman with MS. And with that label came so many limitations, you know, things I could do and things that I couldn't do. And uh, it was on that day that I decided, you know what? Um, that's not who I am. I'm not this disease. And um, I will define my path. And shortly after he left, I started to do a little bit of jogging and, and um, it didn't go so well at first. And, but I kept going out. And there's a little nature preserve that's a, about a block away from my house. And there's a, a body of water in the center. If you make it the entire way around this little path, it's about a a mile and a tenth. And I remember the first day I, I went the entire way around without falling or, or stopping. And I felt invincible. I felt like I can do uh, anything I set my mind to. And on that day, I decided that I would someday uh, run that marathon. That was back in uh, 2006. And I and in 2010, I actually crossed the finish line at the New Jersey Marathon. And for me, that was such an, an extraordinary moment because it really um, signified all the all that I had done uh, had really come together, and 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 it showed that the work that I had done, the changes that I had implemented in my life, had really borne fruit. Mm. Wow! So, in two thousand and three and four, when you were doing this transition, what sort of help and resources were available to you? I know the China study wasn't out yet. You know, all the blogs and like the Forks Over Knives was six years away. What, what did you uh, lean upon for, for guidance? Yeah, so I, I didn't become familiar with any of those things until much later. And it was great because then I was like, wow, there, look at all this evidence really supporting what I'm. It was really just um, study. I, like I just said, I went to PubMed and I put in words like diet and disease. 
And there, there was just, I, just things like, like the DASH study, the Leon Heart trial, the Adventist data, the Framingham Heart study. I just started to read all of this literature that, this, that connected diet and on the chronic diseases that I was seeing as a physician on a daily basis. And it was from that evidence that, that I, I just came to the conclusion, if this is effective for these chronic diseases, then there has to be value uh, in this with autoimmune disease. Because autoimmune disease, again, you know, the nidus of illness uh, in all of these examples is really inflammation. And I started to think, well, how could this serve me? There was evidence in the, in the uh, cancer literature that supported, uh, uh, you know, diet. And, and, and not only prevention, but also in patients with recurrence, reducing rates of recurrence. So there was evidence out there, um, uh, and even some evidence in the autoimmune uh, beginning. There was some seed that, again, you know, Swank's work was published in 1952. He published another article in 1970 in the Archives of Neurology, and then a, a, a publication in 1990. And there were there were articles written about his work. And so um, that was enough for me to at least begin uh, this journey. And, and again, as I started to uh, introduce these, these dietary changes in my life, I started to feel there were, there were signs in, even early on that things were going in the right direction. All right. I'm, I'm wondering, like, what, in terms of practical advice, like did you meet – you know, vegans or plant-based people or, or get cookbooks or, you know, I know people who, who suddenly get the idea to change their diet. They simply can't imagine like what a plant centered plate would even look like. Like what does food look like now? Cause I'm giving up everything that I'm familiar with. Where did, where did you turn for that? Or do you just sort of, you know, cobble it together on your own? I really did cobble it together on my own. I, I just, what, what I did was I just took whatever I loved and I modified it. You know, like I'm, I, I'm Cuban. So, you know, one of my favorite dishes is black beans. And, but it all, it would also mean maybe uh, roasted pork, which is a big uh, part of the Cuban diet or, you know, a lot of meat dishes. And I just, I just cut those things out. Or my husband, for example, is Italian American. So uh, pasta dishes were a really big, like one of his favorite dishes uh, is, is broccoli rob with Italian sausage and orecchietti. So we would modify dishes like that. So instead of sausages, we would add cannellini beans and we would add a ton of, of broccoli rob and, and maybe some red peppers. So I just took all of our favorite recipes and I modified them, excluding the animal sources. And I think it's important to note that my husband joined me on this. You know, I think it's important that you have support in your home because I, I often meet patients and they say, well, I can do that. I'm going to have to cook two different meals, one for myself and one for my family. And that just doesn't work, right? We really want support coming from every direction. So he would, he would help me. And, um, it, and yes, it was, it felt uncomfortable, but I knew, or we, we both decided that this was important enough for us that we were willing to make some sacrifices. And what we, we just, started to feel better. Uh, my husband also reaped extraordinary benefits. I mean, he's, he was always a little bit overweight. Uh, in fact, more than a little bit overweight, he struggled with his weight and he had sleep apnea and cholesterol issues. And he's changed his life and he no longer has sleep apnea. He lost, I think, 30, 40 pounds. And he, he went on to do Ironman races. He's done five Ironman races. So if you know anything <laughs> about Ironman, it's an extraordinary feat. I mean, he went from being a couch potato to, you know, swimming two and a half miles, then riding a bike for a hundred and whatever, 50, 60 miles, I think it is, and then running a marathon all in one day. So that's what my husband's accomplished. So again, he's been an extraordinary support for me. Uh, and we've done this together and, and raised our children uh, to similarly eat this way. And, and so that's been our environment over the past, you know, several years. Wow. And so I'm imagining you're, you, you, you see these incredible results. Other people can see them in you instantaneously. Do you have at that point some sort of naive view that you're going to be able to convince your colleagues? <laughs> well, no, I think, I, think I, um, I, I, can't, I have convinced many of my colleagues. I don't know if I think I mentioned this uh, during plant stock, but in my, in my practice, I have north of 20 patients 
that are also physicians, which is really extraordinary and has been such a gift for me, something I, I could have never predicted when I started my little practice in 2012. Um, and ha- it happened because at one point we had a patient in common, like a diabetic or or a hypertensive patient that came to see me wanting to learn more about lifestyle and how that could affect uh, their disease. And that patient is successful, right, comes off of the diabetes medications, loses that weight that they've been dealing with over uh, most of their adult life. And then they go back to see their internist or their endocrinologist or their cardiologist for their yearly follow-up. And the cardiologist says, well, what did you do? You're off the Lipitor. What's going on? Your cholesterol has dropped 60 points. What, what's happening? Um, I went to see Dr. Stancic. She's a lifestyle medicine physician. And then the first thing they say is, what is that? I've never even heard of lifestyle medicine. <laughs> right? and, and then they call me, the doctors call me, and we have a conversation on the phone. And they ask all about what I'm doing. They're a little suspicious and a little skeptical. And and we have a conversation. And I speak to the evidence. I, I, I say, give me your email. Let me send you this literature to support what we're doing here. And um, then they call me back, Howard, and they say, you know what, I, I, I want to see you. I want to I come visit with you. And I, and I always think it's like a social visit. So, sure, come over. We'll have some tea. And they <laughs> say, no, no, I want to see you as a patient because, you know what, I'm overweight. I have um, hypertension and I'm depressed. I'm burnt out. I need, I need something, uh, a new approach. And for me, that is amazing because when I can help that, individual who is a patient and a physician get them healthy then it changes their perspective it changes how they see the world of medicine and how they practice medicine moving forward and that's been for me an extraordinary um extraordinary experience with this practice right so so it sounds like just like an echo of your story that what opened you up to alternative viewpoints was your own struggle your 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 own suffering that right. when when doctors suffer enough, they can sometimes be willing to accept and uh, explore other paradigms. Um, well, and we don't want just doctors to uh, change when they suffer. Right. right. We well, that's uh, yeah. I kind of I kind of wanted to get to like the motivation for this for this film. I know we have about ten minutes left to talk, and I definitely want to you know yeah. get people excited and and hopefully get them to support the the film the the documentary. Um, there must have been, you know, there must have been some point at which you said, we've, we've got, I've got to do more to get this message out. Right. And, I, and that's exactly right. So I, I started to do things like, like things like this, like a podcast and, and write, in, and write articles and, and lecture, you know, in churches, hospitals, uh, schools, wherever they would invite me to, to spread the word and to reach more and more, um, individuals. And, and then I, I came across, um, I think one of the critical um, points here was I I started to meet with young medical students. Uh, One young man came to visit me and and talked about his interest in 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 his in pursuing lifestyle medicine as a discipline. And and I was really excited about that because in that example, see, this wasn't an individual that was suffering that wanted to change medicine because he or she was suffering, but he was an individual that was evolved to such a point that he understood. Uh, and valued the the importance of this approach in clinical medicine. And so his, this young man who came to visit me, his name is Saul Batista, he was sort of that introduction for me. And I started to, to see it wasn't just Saul, that there were so many young men and women who were interested in a career in medicine that wanted to do this. And they were reaching out to me, uh, telling me their stories and, and asking me how they could learn this because they weren't getting it in medical school. So that a combination of that hearing from young people and also from my colleagues and my peers, my patients who were physicians, they, they would say to me, why didn't we learn this in medical school? And again, it, it, it was uh, mail and letters and, and people reaching out to me through, through um, so many different avenues and saying to me, why weren't we learning this in medical school? And we needed to change that. And so that was really uh, the impetus behind making this film, Code Blue, which is really about shedding light on this extraordinary lapse in healthcare, um, this ex- absurdity that we don't learn the most important lesson that we need to learn as healthcare professionals, the value of diet and, and the importance that it plays 
again, not only in disease prevention, but also management and reversal. And there are, by the way, medical schools out. There is one medical school, uh, the University of South Carolina in Greenville, which we're, we will feature in Code Blue. It is a medical school that was built five years ago, and it is built on the principles of lifestyle medicine. So it's, a, it's an extraordinary academic institution uh, where these kids come in day one, and uh, they are taught throughout the entire four years Lifestyle medicine and the principles of lifestyle medicine are built into their curricula. And even the environment that they've created where they're taught day one, self-care is health care. They teach, you know, they have these young people complete VO2. They do blood work on them. They, they give them personal goals to maintain health. And that's really important because doctors, regrettably, are not the healthiest individuals around. And we need to be the example for our communities, right? That's an important lesson um, to learn, that we are the examples of health in our community. So we should exemplify health. And that means that we should not be smokers, right? That means that we should um, be physically active. Uh, we do uh, something called Walk with a Doc. I don't know if you're familiar with that organization, a wonderful organization uh, started by a cardiologist in Ohio. And we meet weekly with patients and walk in the park. Again, just being the example that this is an important part of our lifestyle is to be physically active and talking about that. So um, this is a school in South Carolina that is doing that, which is a great example. And we can do this across the country. We just need to create um, change. We need, uh, uh, we need to catalyze change within uh, the academic institutions and, and really uh, garner the attention of those that are creating the curricula, because I believe if we do that, if we change this, if this, we have this paradigm shift, we can do extraordinary things uh, and really empower our communities to regain control of their personal health. Great. So what can you tell us about the movie? Um, you know, what the, what the plot is, you know, a little teaser to make us want to see it. And then where, where it is, where is it in its, in its uh, production life cycle and what we can do to uh, support it. Yeah. So the film is about, um, is, re is really about this lapse, that nutrition is not taught in medical school. And really, uh, the storyline tells my personal story. So the, the, the filmmaker is really bringing all of this to light, this, the, where we are today in healthcare, what we're teaching medical doctors, and what the lapses are. But through this, she's there's a string that runs through the entire film that tells my story and tells my personal evolution. Or, you know, how did I get to where I am today and why am I so passionate about this? And throughout this journey, we've traveled across the country and we've met extraordinary, uh, you know, lifestyle medicine experts and, and pioneers in this discipline of plant-based nutrition. And each one of these experts is telling us their perspective why this is important, what we need to do to turn the tide of the chronic illness epidemic. And along this journey, it's not just speaking to the experts, but it's also telling the stories of so many patients across the country that have similarly changed their lives, just like I, had, I did. And again, there's no magic to this. It's just about empowering uh, and educating the public, because we can all do this. In addition to that, a large part of this is telling the stories of these medical students who really, uh, I believe this next generation, this millennial generation is extraordinary. They are so evolved and, and so aware. And I believe that, you know, they are the future. They are the future chairmen of medicine and the future um, deans of medical school. And they know that this is important and they know this is the future. And so really this film is celebrating this uh, movement that is happening right now in medicine and it is really growing. But we have a long way to go. And for me, it's this film, my hope is that it will catalyze all of us to speak to us, to speak to this, to demand change in a very positive way. Uh, here's an example. I can tell you in our medical school in New Jersey and Newark, inside of our cafeteria, Howard, sits a Burger King restaurant. That's extraordinary that a Burger King restaurant sits within the hospital of our state tertiary care center. And it's been there since 1995, and it's and it's and it's serving our patients, our medical students, our residents, our doctors, our employees really bad food, food that is laden with sugar, salt, and fat, and it's unacceptable. Again, 
you know, I'm all about choice. If the Burger King were across the street, that's fine with me. But the fact that's within the hospital, that tells our community that as physicians and as healthcare professionals and as a healthcare facility, we're saying it's A-OK for you to eat this food. It would be no different than selling cigarettes, right? At some point, we did. We used to sell cigarettes in hospitals and we used to smoke in hospitals. But once we knew better, we removed it. Today, we know better. We know that fast foods fuel chronic diseases. They have no place inside of hospitals. So I started a petition. It's been there for so many years and I've been writing politicians and no one seems to um, be interested in in responding to me. So this Saturday, I I started a petition on change.org. So we could to collect signatures and let those administrators at, at University Hospital in Newark know that this is unacceptable. In 2017, we know too much to allow another day of this Burger King within the facility. But we have to speak. We have to speak and we have to speak out loud. That's the only way we're going to create change. Yeah. So I signed that petition and I'm wondering how long will it be available? Should I, if I put a link in the show notes, will people still be able to sign it or does it have a shelf life? No, it doesn't have a shelf life. I, I mean, I want to collect as many signatures as possible. And my my hope is to go before the board. They have a public meeting every couple of months. I'd love to have 10,000, 100,000 signatures, as many as we, we I want them to know that this is a, an issue that resonates with us all. Great. So I'll, I'll put a link to that petition in the show notes for this episode. Thank you so much. I appreciate and- that. Yeah. And so where, where, when, where is the movie in terms of when can we see it? Is there, are there ways to support it, to promote it, to, um, yeah. to contribute to crowdfunding? Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. So we're just about done. We filmed uh, Colin Campbell yesterday in Ithaca. It's one of our last interviews. So the filming is, is, is about 98% complete and we're now going into post-production. Uh, a few weeks ago, we, we initiated an Indiegogo campaign uh, to raise money for post-production, we actually did the we actually made the entire film with about a little less than thirty thousand dollars. So it's extraordinary how we we accomplished so much. But now post-production is is expensive. The editing alone is is quite pricey. So um, we did start this campaign, and we need uh, your help to get us to the finish line. I think we have another uh, eleven days left in the campaign uh, to get us there. Uh, so we're hoping that if this resonates with you, that uh, uh, you can maybe make a small donation uh, and, and and share with others. All right. Well, so that that, that answers my question. I just I uh, I was going to do this, um, publish this in like mid December, but we're gonna we're gonna have to kick everything else back. So this will be the next <laughs> one. <laughs> so I think I'll, I'll get this out today's today's the seventh. I'll get this out on uh, on Friday the tenth. Oh, thank you so much, Howard. I appreciate so, yeah, it. Yeah, we, we got, we got, we, it's code blue, right? That, that means we got to rush. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So uh, I, I we'll won't... Get... Go ahead. No, no, I said we'll get there. We'll find a way. Yeah, well, I want, I want my people to help you <laughs> find that I way. Um, I have one more question, and maybe it's a, uh, a political question or a science question. I'm not entirely sure. So you, you and I are both on the council of the True Health Initiative, which is very much into lifestyle medicine. Like that's the whole point of things. And I, you know, we, we all agree like, you know, smoking, bad stress, bad sleep, good exercise, good. (laughs) But as you may know, there's a whole bunch of people on that council who aren't so into the plant-based diet and they might be more sort of paleo or ketogenic and, you know, so great. They're getting rid of the processed food. Um, but like, do you, how how do you navigate the world of people who are, you know, we're thrilled that they're saying, yeah, lifestyle is the key, but maybe they're getting some of the details pretty differently from you and me when it comes to nutrition. How, how do you think about them and work with them and navigate, you know, that uh, tightrope? It's a good question. It, and it's a, it's a difficult subject. And I, and I think, um, David Katz has, has addressed this, I think, most eloquently. I think we just try to find the common ground. That's where we start. Um, and I think, in general, most of us can agree that um, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, in the very least, that those and, and legumes, well, maybe not. I, I know the paleo, there are groups that, that have issues with legumes, but there are some uh, commonalities, and that's where I think we begin. And 
for those that have uh, very different opinions, I think, and I say this to my patients because there's so many, there, it, you know, nutrition is so confusing. There's so many different opinions. There's the, you know, the gluten-free, GMO, organic versus, there's so many issues that, that arise that complicate the whole thing. I always, I always say, uh, the advice that I always give is, let's turn to the literature. And what does the literature tell us? Um, what does the overwhelming body of evidence point to? And if we, if we do that and we look at that literature objectively, I think it's pretty safe to say that a diet that is rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes is going to take you a long way. And the question, and we can argue whether some dairy or some animal sources, we can have those discussions, uh, you know, respectable debates. But I think the most important aspect in this very convoluted and confused topic that is nutrition is let's let's begin by agreeing on on uh, the common ground. And, and I think if we start there, um, we can we can help uh, to alleviate so many questions that the public has about what they should be eating. Great, that's that's uh, wonderful. So, how can people find you? Find the work online. Yeah, so um, my website is drstancic.com, and so on, on that website, there, there are links to Code Blue. There's all, the Code Blue website is codebluedoc.com, so doc is that t- double entendre for doctor documentary. Uh, uh, and on that website, you'll see our, our link uh, to the Indiegogo campaign uh, that, again, it, it, it wraps up on November 17th. And... Um, it's been an extraordinary experience. It's been two years of working on this film. Uh, it's been uh, a labor of love, and I'm really excited. Uh, next year, when the film comes out, I really feel that we're going to make a really important film that is going to uh, make uh, offer some significant changes and, and bring, hopefully, um, positive changes to the field of medicine that's, go- that's going to serve uh, not only patients, but physicians alike. That's awesome. So, and uh, I'm imagining Burger King isn't going to be sponsoring any of the showings. <laughs> I don't think so. No. no. So this, this, this I, is going to have to be largely grassroots, largely the people uh, who have heard your message, who have benefited from it, who have, adopted this lifestyle like we're, we're the ones who are going to be the change here absolutely oh and that's that's exactly right we just want to reach a lot of people you know very small donations from a, a lot of people that's that's the best approach right we, that's exactly what we want um and we're, we're going to get there i'm not we're going to keep at it until we get there but we're, this film will be completed and we're going to share this film with the world uh next year and i'm so excited because we want to, again, educate and empower as many to take control and regain control of their personal health. We can all do this. There's no magic to this. Um, we just need the information. And, and, and when patients have the information, they will make those changes. Awesome. One, one last question. Do you do telemedicine or do people have to uh, be lucky enough to live in New Jersey to, to yeah. see you? <laughs> Right. Lately, I have been doing a little bit of telemedicine. In general, I like to see patients at least once in the beginning. My, you know, my first visit is a bit lengthy. It's two hours. And the reason I do that is because I really want to get to know the patient. I do a thorough physical exam and, and then do a lot of education. Because, beha- you know, lifestyle medicine is largely behavioral change. And that, that requires a, a good bit of invested time. It's unlike what I used to do in clinical medicine with a 10 to 15 minute appointment. So I really want to get to know my patients. I want them to get to know me because we require a, a, the development of a relationship of trust. And you can't do that in 10 or 15 minutes. So I typically like to do that first visit uh, in person. And then I can do follow-ups uh, through telemedicine. But as requirement, you know, things are starting to change. So I have been seeing some patients who um, are a bit, a bit uh, far away. I have been helping them through through that uh, avenue, but ideally, I like to see patients in person. Great. And so, your website, the, the doc, drstancic dot com, is it dr or d o c t o r? It's d r s t a n c i c dot com. Okay, great. And so, people can look you up. They can go straight there. They can find the uh, URL in the show notes. Um, 
Wow. So I'm, I'm so thrilled that you agreed to take the time to, to share your story. You're sort of all, all over the, my, my Facebook feed and plant-based world. You're doing incredible work. Um, your talk at Plant Stock, I was you know, overhearing and talking to a lot of people about how inspirational it was. And I am so thrilled that you are, are one of the, the captains, coaches, and leaders of our team. Thank you so much, Howard. It means the world to me. I really appreciate it. I'm so glad you were at Plants Back and, and we're there to hear it. Right on. Couldn't wouldn't wouldn't miss it. And I encourage everybody to, to to attend these events and plug in. And you might meet someone as wonderful as Dr. Sarai Stancic yourself. So, Dr. Stancic, thank you so much for all you do and for taking the time today. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a great pleasure to speak to you. If you enjoyed this episode of the Plant Yourself podcast, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. For more information about the Big Change Program, led by me and Josh Lajani, visit bigchangeprogram.com. And be sure to check out the show notes for today's episode with links to everything we talked about and especially the Indiegogo campaign for Code Blue at plantyourself.com slash 238. If you're new to the show, you can catch up on 237 archived episodes over at plantyourself.com. And if you get the podcast, but not my weekly-ish newsletter, The Big Change Bulldog, you can get that at plantyourself.com as well. If you'd like to support this show and help us spread the word, you can share this and other episodes on social media and via email. You can write that iTunes review, and you can become a patron of the show with an ongoing contribution, and you can do that at Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. You can just search for Plant Yourself or go to patreon.com slash plant yourself, or you can go to plantyourself.com and look for the Patreon link in the right sidebar. In garden news, getting cold out there. The only thing that's really looking happy is the arugula, which uh, I can eat as a condiment, but it's kind of hard to uh, eat huge amounts of it or do it in smoothies. So um, we're hoping that will last for the entire winter. The uh, compost bin doesn't look any better than it did the last time I talked to you, but uh, hopefully we'll get some nice weather and I'll find some good wood and put it all together. In running news, I'm considering going down to the Baton Rouge Marathon in January. Haven't decided yet, um, but I decided I'm going to do a 50 miler this coming year. So if I've done my second 50K, I lived. So it's time to, uh, to up it a little bit and see what the next 19 miles would be like after having already run 31. So it's the thank you time again. Thanks to Will Ridenauer for allowing me to use this beautiful song, Sabali Don, The Dance of Peace. Check out willridenauer.com for more of his gorgeous Chora music. And last and most, thanks to all you Plant Yourself podcast patrons. I got a couple new names for you this week, which I will get to at the end of today's honor roll. Here we go. Kim Harrison, Lynn McClellan, Anthony Disson, Brittany Porter, Dominic Myra, Barbara Whitney, Tammy Black, Amy Good, Amanda Hatherley, Mary Jane Wheeler, Alan Kennel, Lee, Melissa Cobb, Rachel Barons, Christine Nielsen, Tina Sharp, Dean Ahern, Jen Kukanovsky, David Bizek, and Mysterious, Michelle X, Elizabeth Feldman, Victoria Dolomanova, Leah Stoller, Alan Christensen, Colleen Peck, Michelle Andrew, Josie, Julianne Rowland, Stu Dolnick, Sarah Durkis, Ryan the Circus, Kelly Cameron, Wayne Patterson, Leanne Peterson, Janet Selby, Claire Adams, Tom Franzek, Jeanette Bedham, Gila Lasser, Donna David, Donna Hugh Blair, Cyber, Dorona Bizov, Gio and Carolyn Argentati, Judy Friesner, Rothan Thunder Burke. No, 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 gotta do that one again. <laughs> Ruth Ann Thunderberg, Misha Rosen, Michael Warbeck, the equally mysterious Tracy Z, Alicia Lemus, Rebecca Hughes, Val Lineman, their rhymes with cinnamon, Nick Harper, Stephanie Hallsmith, Martha Bergner, Nicole Ramsey, Susan Ahmad, Molly Levine, the inscrutable Harry R. Susan Laverty, the Panda Vegan, Craig Kovic, Adam Sharp, Karen Burry, Heather Morgan, Ashley Cor- Corcoran, Kelly Machia, Deanne Norton, Bonnie Lynch of Plant Happy Oregon, Sabine Kurtzels, Nigel Davies, Marion Blum, Teresa Copel, Shell Rutledge, Jan- Julian Watkins, Breed O'Connell, Brian Sheridan, Shannon Hirschman, Kate Rolls, Linda Ayat, Julie Lang, Holm Hedegaard, Isa Tuzinoa, and Connie Hainlein for your generous support of the podcast. That really is it for this week. I'll probably be back with two more episodes next week. We'll have to see how I'm feeling. And as always, be well, my friend.